Hey, John, we are back again. Welcome to the Unriveted Podcast, where we dial in on technology, intersections of digital transformation, artificial intelligence, and people. Our goal with this podcast, Unriveted, is to talk about topics from the past, the present, and the future as they apply to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the modernization of process automation. And as usual, this episode is brought to you by Wingnut Investments, which we're tightening the ROI. You, you ready, John? It's just a um screw away. <laughs> Ouch. John, what are we going to talk about today? All right, Martin. So the last time uh, we talked about this topic, observability and explainability, we talked mostly from the perspective of observability, which is kind of one end of the ML ops spectrum. And today we're going to talk about explainability, which is kind of an extension of observability. That's excellent, John. You know, this is becoming more and more a hot topic in the world of AI and, and ML, specifically due to the concerns of whether the efficacy is there. How do we know why things are happening? Can we explain it? So this is pretty awesome, John. Right, right. Explainability is becoming much more important uh, as people start to interact more with the things that we call artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, specifically, I think Chat GPT, which we did a couple of episodes on. Um, in fact, we did an episode trying to see how we could push the limits of Chat GPT's ethical uh, standards. So, explainability is really kind of all in that uh, in that sense, and why it's interesting to us. Uh, we could talk about this for several episodes, and I'm sure we will, but today let's just do kind of a high-level overview. Does that sound good to you? That sounds good, John. You know, my attention to detail falls off somewhere between uh, <laughs> zero and 10 seconds, so just jump right into it. Well, let's we'll see if we can do that to zero to 10 minutes, maybe. <laughs> so first of all, you know, observability that, you know, you talked about in, in great length the last time we went down uh, on this path of the subject. You know, observability, when we think about it in the sense of a machine learning system or just any, you know, kind of software system is really trying to answer the what, you know, what is going on in my, um, in my system? You know, can I see when things break? Can I see how things are moving? Uh, if something does break, do I have alerts and triggers that will inform, you know, my support folks about that? I think we use the, uh, the acronym MELT, right? So metrics. Uh, events, logs, and traces, and how those all kind of intimately work together to bring what we call observability. And we could use a lot of that stuff in ML too, but uh, explainability is really taking that to the next step. So if observability is answering the what is going on, explainability, and sometimes we call that interpretability, is trying to answer the how and the why uh, for our machine learning models when we have those in production. Does that make sense so far? So far, it's working for me, John. <laughs> well, that's good to know. So a couple of things we'll talk about, and then I'll open it up for some questions and conversation. When we talk about explainability, we're really trying to say, you know, uh, how do I take a machine learning model that might be considered a, a black box, right? We take some input data, we train the model on that input data, and then the model is, you know, designed to make predictions about the given task in the future. So explainability is trying to answer the question, why is the model making the predictions that it's making? And obviously this becomes important for, you know, highly regulated businesses that need to report why they're using those tools to regulating bodies. Can they trust the, those uh, those systems? Are they transparent? If the feds come knocking on their door, can they say, oh, you know, I understand why, you know, your model made this prediction for this group of people, but not this group of people. And it's also helpful for helping data scientists really debug uh, and understand, you know, uh, how the machine that they're using to train the models thinks about the data. So it's almost like, you know, human and uh, computer working together in, in, in beautiful harmony, at least from that application. I, I can see imagery already and behold <laughs> that imagery in my mind. For our viewing audience. So, you know, what, you know, a couple of the elements uh, in explainability, 
So model performance metrics, and a lot of these overlap when we think about ML ops in general. So model performance, you know, I train a model on some training data in my laboratory environment on my local machine or development environment in the cloud. Uh, and then I deploy that into the environment where it's going to make predictions. I want to make sure that the predictions it's making are, you know, aligned with the actual value, the estimate versus the actual common, you know, common approach in the data science world. We also want to know how. Segway real quick. Uh, sorry. Yeah. You know, the investment that you put into why you're doing it, you should have a hypothesis or, or some expected, what are you going to get out of this? For this investment, this is what I'm trying to achieve and why I'm trying to achieve it. And this is how I'm going to measure it and how I'm going to explain it. Right. So all makes sense. Keep going, John. I just, sorry to sure, just, sure. Had, uh, just, I was feeling it. I was feeling the vibe. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. If we deploy a machine learning model and the goal of that model is to save our organization money by adding efficiencies or to earn our organization additional money by, you know, bringing in more customers or keeping our customers happy, then uh, there's no way for us to know how well it works or how much we should continue to invest in that unless we have some measure of performance in the real world. So you can see it becomes very important. Explainability also covers things like data drift, you know, data changes over time. Uh, so these models, sometimes, you know, you put it into production, it's not going to stay working the same way it does on day one. Data quality. So data quality is obviously important. If, you know, the distribution of a feature in our data set changes over time, that could have a serious impact on our model's performance. And therefore, we might have to retrain a model or come up with a different model. And then again, like we talked about a little bit earlier, the bias detection, right? So bias detection uh, is very much like, you know, is my model favoring, you know, certain uh, certain groups of people or certain, you know, uh, people that are generating certain kinds of data compared to others? This goes back to the regulation, um, you know, if you are in a regulated industry, Explainability is really trying to answer the question, you know, what's going on underneath the hood of my machine learning models? And, you know, for some organizations, you really have to know uh, what that is, not just for your own internal knowledge, but, you know, for investors or, uh, or the people that are experiencing the decisions that model's making about them. All right. So, um, you know, you and I, Martin, we've actually spoken with a couple of uh, organizations that uh, actively uh, have tools for ML observability and explainability. Both of them have, you know, very solid offerings, uh, Arise.ai and Aporia, which are both uh, software tools designed specifically to fit into that uh, gap uh, for all the things that we talked about in you know, to including explainability and observability uh, in your production ML models. Hey, John. Yeah, we, we, we have spoken to those vendors and I recall very, um, very good detail on the way they integrate, the way they operate, where they're going to actually need to see, you know, the feature of the, da the data feature, um, how to instrument the workflow, and then you know, getting into hyperparameters effectively, right? And and then mm -hmm. looking at where the KPIs might be, uh, points for measurement has to be part of the equation too. So it's a deep integration. It's not a trivial integration. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, when you're developing a ML system or an ML pipeline or whatever you want to call it, you know, these types of considerations should be at the very beginning of the development process. It's not something that you go through the elaborate setup of developing an end-to-end -end pipeline and then drop, you know, an observability, explainability tool at the end, it should be a component of the planning and development process uh, from the very beginning, you know, for all the reasons that we just talked about. If you don't know how well your models are performing in the real world, then you really have nothing to back it up when it comes to how to uh, put your budget uh, towards efforts of, of building out those, those systems in the first place. Uh, so it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I know that we've spoken with those folks before and 
like I said, uh, or like you said, they're also great, uh, great offerings. When we talk about these type of solutions, there's there's a couple areas that that pop in and pop out, and people talk about model registry, model mm -hmm. monitoring, and they're not necessarily the same type of solutions. And some of the vendors that that cover these may be closer to like I would call lifecycle tools, mm -hmm. and Sometimes the the magic here isn't the life cycle. I'm not talking about the front end. I'm talking about the journey of productionalizing it and and knowing mm -hmm. where I'm going. Much like you know the imagery of the aircraft flying without an instrument <laughs> panel in the fog, as you know, and and that imagery, mm -hmm. and you're going to see it really vividly in a moment. <laughs> and um, it's not pretty. So talk me through how these vendors could help us. Right, right. So explainability, I mean, again, depending on how broad of a, <laughs> excuse me, definition that you want to uh, create for it, because it's still a very new field and, you know, the knowledge building is, is, is pretty nascent still. So a lot of people are still kind of getting their, you know, feet wet in it, so to speak. But I think what you brought up is a very good point. And I think, you know, when we talk about data science, and maybe I've said this before, but the science part is not just there, <laughs> it's not just there to sound, you know, uh, like, it compl like something complicated. It, it is a complicated process. So you could apply scientific techniques and methodology to the same process as here. So, you know, there's a problem in science and there's a problem in data science. And part of that is called reproducibility, right? So a uh, very important part of the observability and explainability elements in ML is the reproducibility part. So like you said, or alluded to, I guess, there's the, the um, versioning. How do we version? You think about traditional software, we version our code, right? That pretty much goes without saying. We put out a release, something breaks, maybe we in desperation have to roll back completely or roll back some features. In machine learning, you really have to version not only the code, you have to version the data, especially the data that you use to train a model with. So a timestamp at minimum uh, to know what data exactly went into a model during training. And in top of the code, as well as the data, you also have to version the model itself because most of the times data scientists have to generate, you know, 10, 15, 20 candidate models during their, you know, their laboratory process, we'll say, before they actually choose one for production. And if you save all of those models in a registry, when it comes time for the ML ops process to kick in due to, you know, data drift, model drift, all the things we talked about that explainability uses to say something's wrong, a lot of times, some of those models that were trained in the past can be re, you know, reutilized or pulled out of that model registry, put into production, and you know, basically not miss a step for whatever the application is. Now, when you automate that entire process, that's kind of the golden, you know, the golden key uh, to six, uh, successful ML ops. Uh, but it's a lot easier said than done, I suppose. So as as we go through this journey, I think. We could actually do a talk just on various aspects here. We could talk about the versioning aspects of just the data. We could talk about mm -hmm. the versioning aspects of the code base um, as an mm -hmm. SDLC. All of it can be considered as part of an SDLC. And we could also talk about parameter versioning, hyperparameter versioning. We could talk mm -hmm. about um, you know cause and effect. Where, where things kind of get a little fuzzy for me is all this trying to explain what's going on when we talk about uh, a generative type model, it may be problematic where what we call reproducibility is mm -hmm. low. So even with, you know, I would say the best cases of language model, you give it a question and it gives you a response and it's a, a mm -hmm. block of text and you give it the same question again, 10 minutes later, it doesn't necessarily give you the same block of text. And right. so the essence may be correct in both cases, what the intent and the output, but they're not identical. So it would 
would it, would you consider that a failure of reproducibility or just an artifact of a model type? And that's the artifact of a generative model is that reproducibility could be um, something that is not achievable. Uh, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I think, you know, and I admittedly haven't really thought about it that in depth, but, you know, I think when you talk about reproducibility in terms of an ML model or an ML system, it still goes code. You could still take a model like GPT and you could still version the code, you know, version the code that was used to develop it. You could still version the model and you could still version the data that was used to train it. So you can still cover all three of those bases. Um, but when it comes to, and I'm not sure, maybe it's more of saying, what is the way to measure whether or not a generative AI model is producing output that is meet, you know, there is no estimate versus actual, right? <laughs> so you can envision in your head the response you want something like chat GPT to provide for you. And maybe right. it would, um, but then you start going down into semantics and, and, and language and, and synonyms and antonyms. And, you know, you go down this whole other path where it's an intriguing question, actually, to think about how could you understand if a model that's generative, and it could be, you know, generative for like imagery, like we've seen with Dolly or Leonardo AI, um, to actually say, well, you know, can I tell the difference between the model that was released a month ago, two months ago, five months ago, if they're all doing something where the output may just naturally be different every time. So yeah, I got I got to think about that one, <laughs> but it is a good question. <laughs> it is good. And maybe I'll present here a couple examples um, to show, like I'll give an example text and I'll put it up on the screen here in a moment. And then I'll come back a couple minutes later and we'll do the same thing. And for brevity, I'll, I'll editorial on the, on the video. So we, we don't have the huge lapse. And then I'll try the okay. same thing in one of the graphical ones. And yeah. let's just see the reproducibility <laughs> factor. It, it, these models aren't intended to do that. So let's just kind of show and tell for an example of what reproducibility really means. If you mm -hmm. think of like a medical instrument and a diagnosis or something you need to do, something that doesn't look right in the body and diagnosis, and you want to be very consistent, much better than a human would be. That's the reason you would use the machine. So right. we know that humans will get fatigue factor and the, and the machines, hopefully, unless they, you know, go out and strike <laughs> on us, uh, will, will not have fatigue, but right. um, this is a really good topic, John. And I think I would look forward to talking more about, you know, deeper dives in, in some of the areas as we go forward. I think we have plenty of time and, and plenty of topics to cover, Martin. So I'm, I'm ready to go if you are. Awesome. Well, how about we call this one a wrap? Thanks, everybody. And remember to like us when, if, you, if you enjoy and send us a comment or question. And I'm Martin Miller. And you are? John Sukup. And together we are unriveted. Thank you for your time. Thank you.